way. <laughs> that bell was donated to us. That actually was uh, from the uh, from the old uh, Linglestown High School. So we cherish that. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody. This is a nice, it's nice to see a nice crowd like this, and especially as ugly as it is outside. And um, I'd like to start out if, um, if uh, Bill could lead us in the Pledge of the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excellent. And I'd like to start out this evening by saying a huge thank you uh, to uh, Bruce Holroyd for um, his fantastic artwork. Bruce, would you stand up? I mean, this is one talented artist, and, I, and uh, uh, he, he's done all three of our postcards so far. This one actually uh, was a little, we'll call this a big postcard, just because we couldn't get all the information on it. But uh, his work's amazing, and if you need any artwork done, grab a card. Um, I'd, we're going to have in May our next in-person uh, presentation, and that's going to be about on the Eisenhower family and its impact here in, the, uh, in our township. Uh, Pam, at the very end there, she actually lives in Frederick Eisenhower's house who was the great-grandfather great of Dwight Eisenhower. And um, there's actually an Eisenhower farm in this area, and uh, there's a lot of graves. And Bob Thomas, who is not here this evening, uh, will be doing that presentation, so I hope you can join us. It should be interesting, because it's still history that you can touch. Um, because we have a long uh, presentation tonight, and I'll try to keep my part not being too winded. Uh, I would like to ask for a motion to forgo our uh, normal business meeting tonight, except for the adoption of the minutes, and then we'll um, put everything off to our next business meeting, which is scheduled for May 12th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then I'd like to uh, ask for a motion for approval of our minutes. Make a motion to approve the minutes. As written. Any changes? Who seconded? Jay did. Excellent. So with that, um, I would like to start our presentation of the LP schools. And I'll be uh, starting it, but then uh, I know that everybody's excited to hear our guest speaker, since most of you know him very well and uh, want to pick on him brutally throughout. <laughs> so we're looking forward for Gary Chrisman's uh, uh, presentation. However, you're stuck with me for the first part. <laughs> so this is really quite interesting that uh, uh, actually several of my teachers, my past teachers from elementary school are here. So <laughs> you want to hear some stories about how good I was. <laughs> so we'll, that may come out later in the, in the evening, but uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. All right. Um, tonight's presentation, we're going to try to cover a little bit about the, uh, about the school district and how it got to where it is today. And unfortunately, a lot of the older schools, um, the little schools, I'm just going to touch on those tonight because there were so many from the 1700s up through the 1800s that um, that in itself is its own presentation. So we have some goals tonight. I want to discuss the growth of the township, explain the initial consolidation, and explain the creation of the Central Dauphin School District. The, the, when we discuss the township growth, that really is important on how the schools were structured. Because initially, uh, you know, we're, we're dating back to the 1700s. It's a little bit different than what we have today.
Before I get to this slide, I want to mention, I want to give a um, quote from a, a reading that I saw from Nevin Moyer. And Nevin Moyer himself was a, a teacher for many years within this district. And Nevin Moyer made the comment that he said, early settlers wanted three things, a home, a church, and a school. And I agree with that. And the interesting thing is that uh, most of the original schools were associated with the church. And when you look at the heritage, most of this area was um, German reformists, Irish, uh, Irish, Scottish, and English. And when you look at their virtues from, their, from how they were raised, schooling was very, very important. But, you know, 17, uh, 1700s to now, a lot has changed in this area. Let's first look at what Central Dauphin is today. Central Dauphin School District is the ninth largest district in the whole Commonwealth, and that is out of 500 districts. They have a budget over 197 million. They have 19 schools, and they educate approximately 12,000 students a year. It's massive. But let's see what the impact is, because we're talking about Lower Paxton. So I broke it down a little bit. The CD school district in Lower Paxton has um, 10 of their schools are here. So that means we have over 52% of the, of the CD school district schools are located within our township. And in those schools, they're massive. They take up a lot of acreage. So we have six elementary, three middle schools, and one high school. And that's not even talking about the other schools that are outside of the district, such as Bishop McDevitt, um, uh, the uh, Christian uh, school, the Holy Name of Jesus school. But I found this to be quite interesting. And um, so ed education in our area was, was extremely important as it is today. Let's go, now go back a little bit. This is a map from 1858. And on this map, there's a couple things that I want to show. If you look at the red circles, those are the seven schools that were around in 1858. And two of those schools, the buildings are still there today. And I'll show those a little bit later in my presentation that you can um, actually drive by and see them. They're all in different uses now, but, um, but they're still there. And the interesting thing, if you look, a number of the schools go around the major transportation. Because uh, if you look up where it says Mount Zion up in the top, that would be Linglestown Road, which back then was pretty much the main road that you would get um, uh, to Harrisburg or to um, Fort, Fort, to Fort Hunter. Thank you, education. I mean, see how? And then if you look down below, like um, uh, where you see Oakdale School, that would be Union Deposit Road. And again, these roads back then were the main roads for, um, for horse, stagecoach, walking. Uh, a lot of them were original uh, Native American paths that, that we just continue to go with. Now, if you look at Mount Zion School up on top, let's just go a few years ahead, and I want to show you what a, what a class looked like. This was taken in 1886, and the reason that I brought this up was for a couple reasons. One, if you look at the clothing on the, on the kids, most of that clothing, that's not store-bought. That's homemade. You know, th these, are, these are kids from uh, the majority of their families are farmers. A lot of these kids, even as young as they are, probably had farm chores before they went to school. And the interesting thing, back then, the school board really was from the parents. The parents are the ones who negotiated. The parents are the ones who decided uh, what the curriculum would be, who the teacher would be, and what they would be paid. And I was hoping that my brother would be here tonight because the kid right in the middle looked, looked like him when he was little. <laughs> he does have hair. 
But the interesting thing, one of the, one of the uh, perks of being a, a history geek is that you like to uh, research more and more. And uh, I was trying to research the family of the little girl And the boy, I can't read his first name very well, but he's a, he's a, uh, he's actually a lingual. And the little girl, if I, and, and I was just playing around, if I found out she ended up having about 10 children <laughs> and passed away at the age of 61. Too many kids. <laughs> but as we, as we mentioned that the parents were the school board. And the interesting thing is that I know that right now, um, the local uh, CD teachers are, are in uh, talks with negotiations for their new contract. So I thought it would be fun to go back to 1832. This is wording from a contract. George W. DeMars proposed to teach a regular English school three months at light school consisting of the following branches, spelling, reading, writing, and arithmetic, if necessary. We, the subscribers, promised to pay the said G.W. DeMars for the above services $2 per scholar annexed to our name with firewood and a schoolhouse for said term. None subscribers will be required to pay the three cents per day. School will commence on the first Monday in December next, subscription dated October 12, 1832, and about 30 persons, people sign the pledge. So this individual, to teach those kids for three months, made $60 in 1832. So I thought I would submit this to the union and um, let them use that as a negotiating tool. <laughs> so let's go back to the map. Lower Paxton, um, throughout the 1800s, into the 1900s, and really, quite honestly, um, post-World War II mainly was large farms and wooded areas. And this is kind of interesting because if, if, you, if you think about it, we're right outside of our state capital, so this wasn't going to last very long. And the interesting thing that I wanted to also discuss here was that the average classroom size back in the 1800s was about 30 to 40 individuals. And when you look at, because most of the schools were like one, two, possibly three um, school rooms. And when you look at this being seven schools, and I mentioned to you earlier that our um, township under CD has 10 schools, you think, well, what's the difference? I mean, there's only, that's only three different schools. If you took all seven of those schools and added the, ch the child popul the student population, all of those seven schools together would not equal one of our elementary schools today. So I found that to be quite interesting. And the, and the other interesting thing is to know that the reasoning that we formed um, this type of a school district that we have now is because of how much this land is going to change. This is an old picture of uh, the Riker Farm. Now, to give you an idea where this is at, this would be taken about at the corner of what is now Locust Lane and Houks Road at the Calvary United Methodist Church. And that barn that's up on top would be about where the Baptist Church is. And a firm came in and bought roughly 52 acres from the Riker Farm and um, built Colonial Park Gardens, which are the brick um, houses right across the street. And um, I happen to live in one of those houses. So it's quite interesting when you, when you see um, what used to be here. And this was pretty much all of Lower Paxton. But look at the population growth. When we look back around, um, around uh, 1920s, we're looking at a average population of about 2,600 people in the whole township. By the time we hit 1960, we have 17,600. In 10 years, it goes to 26,000 to, um, in the last 2020 population was 53,500. So the farms are gone and suburbia has started. 
the reason for this large population growth after World War II was because you started to get a number of things. One, you had Olmsted um, Air Force Base down in Middletown. You have, again, as I mentioned, Harrisburg being the, the uh, city or the state government, uh, the capital, so people needed to live. In the early 1900s, you started to get mass transit by having a trolley system that went from Harrisburg all the way to Linglestown. So you, you started having more and more people coming out to the wilderness. Our wilderness act here actually had buffalo. The last ones were killed in the 1700s. So it, the, a lot of those kids that, that we uh, saw earlier, maybe not the ones that we saw, the little ones, but the kids that were going to school back in the 1700s, they carried a rifle with them to school because they were worried about wild animals or an upset pack of uh, a, a, a Native American tribe that might be uh, having a uh, patrol out. So things have changed in this area. So suburbia has hit us. And another big um, business is one that we're sitting in right here. This used to be AMP. AMP brought a lot of employees into the area. And people wanted to live close to where they, where they worked. So that's why the, the population took off like it did. Well, let's talk a little bit about the initial uh, the initial consolidation. The initial consolidation um, started happening back in the, uh, in the early 1900s. And one of the very first things that happened to this area, which was amazing, was the Lower Paxton Vocational High School. This is absolutely an accomplishment for this area. I mean, you're coming out of, you know, from the late 1800s, you're coming out of the second uh, uh, industrial period. So people realized that there needed to be more and more skilled trade laborers. And this school was built. This school is huge. What? I mean, this isn't even what you see today. This is just what it was in 1922. And that school was considered huge at the time. But it even got bigger. And this actually, this school has, um, if, any, if you follow us here, you, we did a, uh, we did a uh, presentation about two years ago, well, man, COVID, two or three years ago um, that dealt with the Linglestown Fair. The Linglestown Fair was created by three students that went to this school in the agricultural department. And they um, visited Penn State Agricultural Department, got the idea, worked it out, and remember, I said the population in 1920 was roughly 2,600. That fair brought in about 20,000 people. That came from that school. But even that had to change. Renovation started in 1930. And if, um, and if this interests you, if you um, have time, over on the table right underneath the clock, there's a whole section of um, photogra original photographs there that were given to me um, by jo uh, John Osuch. You probably remember that name from being a principal and a teacher. Um, these, these are fantastic photos because it, you could see the old steam, uh, you know, all the equipment and stuff was steam. And I had to go over the other night, um, my wife was, uh, thinking I was going to get arrested because I'm, I'm walking around this building at, uh, in a, during a rainstorm about 9.30 at night. I had to see for myself. My father taught at that school, and uh, he taught history. Um, but I really didn't know much about the school. This school, when it's done, is going to house elementary, junior high, and the high school. That's forward thinking. That's consolidation. But you saw the population increases that I showed earlier. This will be short-lived as, as a completely consolidated school. And the consolidated school looked like that. And, they, and during that consolidation, they, they were able to um, consolidate Crumbs, Gilcrest, Mount Zion, and Millers. 
Um, so, and the elementary school, again, for this elementary school, it had six rooms for the elementary. We know that's not going to last very long. And soon it didn't. Soon, soon it left. Um, they had to break those out, and this just became a, a uh, high school for a while, then a junior high. However, we had some modern thinkers. And there's two individuals that I really want to point out here. If you look in the top left, uh, back row on the left, that's Dr. Phillips, E.H. Phillips, which E.H. Phillips Elementary was named after. And uh, he, he, bless you, he was such a forward thinker um, and amazing. He, he was the, uh, he actually was the minister, and that's why we handed out Bruce's beautiful artwork tonight. This is where Dr. Phillips was, was a uh, minister. But he stuck with um, education throughout his, uh, throughout his life. And the other person that I want to bring out is a very interesting individual, and he's on the first row on the right, Elmer Eller. Elmer Eller is, uh, was an attorney, and he was an early developer of Lower Paxton. If you ever go over to the, to the original Shoup Cemetery, and you come, um, come into it from the backside off of, like, what is it, Arlington, the largest stone that you'll see there is Elmer Eller's family. And on it, it says, the founder of Colonial Park. His house is amazing. You need to research it if you bring it up. He's the one that lives on Elmerton Avenue. I wonder how he came up with the name of that street. <laughs> and Elmer's house was um, right beside what used to be the old Weber Eye Care there on Elmerton Ave. It's a bit of a mansion. And when you look inside of it, it is gorgeous. And the Elmer, Elmer himself, Again, forward thinker, that's why he was developing in this area. And what an amazing person to have on that school board. The next picture that I'm going to show you is more for eye candy because most of you were tied in with Lower Paxton. And I just wanted you to see some of the individuals. This would have been one of the last faculties prior to it going to um, Lower Paxton Junior High. And if you look in the front row, you'll see Mr. Brightbill, who became pr uh, principal at C Central Dauphin High School. And to, um, to the left of him would be uh, Charlie Fosnott, who became the principal then of uh, Lower Paxton Junior High. And in the back, the, I, uh, from, just from the people hanging out with my dad, I can recognize uh, Mr. Uh, Castle and uh, who's the science, the so a lot of those, so a lot of those teachers, you know, really had, they dispersed and went through a whole lot of the different um, classes or different schools. Um, so I thought that anybody that would have been here that went to LP, at least LP Junior, might recognize some of those pictures. The next part that I'd like to do before I turn it off to, um, to Gary is to show you some of the buildings that are still standing today. Of course, uh, Lower Paxton, which is now um, a church and uh, also multiple um, uh, businesses rent from there. I'm, I'm going to go into the church here in a couple, one of these days, and just see if I, they'll let me walk around. And uh, I would love to see, to see it. I never went there. My wife went there. However, um, when my wife and I met in 10th grade uh, and I introduced myself, she said, no, you're, I had your dad in school. And... Uh, he only, he only had two kids. He only talked about my sister and brother. 
Must, must, must have been an oops, what can I say? The next school, Oakdale. Oakdale is um, right along Union Deposit Road, almost where um, Nye's Road uh, intersects with it. It's now a pigeon club, yep. And again, my wife and I are out taking pictures and she thought we would get arrested, you know, but, uh, but we had, uh, it, it's kind of a neat building and uh, Mr. Morris is here and his neighbor's mother um, taught there. And she had a very, very interesting story when uh, uh, Bob, who's not here tonight, uh, Bob and I went out and met with her because we're working on another project for Cider Press. And um, she was telling us that her, her mother graduated from Millersville Normal School. And uh, when she showed up for the first day, the students all thought, hey, we got a new teacher. And they were going to, uh, you know, have their way with her. With, uh, and uh, she laid the law down pretty quick, and those people respected her. And uh, I would love to have met her. <laughs> she probably has a lot of good stories. The next one, this is Fort, or yeah, Fort Gilcrest. This is um, Gilcrest School. And this one is, is right um, just west of Sheets where Colonial Road meets um, Linglestown Road. And if you, if you drive by, it's, the re it's a residential area now. So please just respect it because it is a residential, but you can drive by it and see it. And that school, the Gilcrest School, actually went through several phases. You know, they kept moving around and changing it as things would fall apart and such. But uh, the, it, the house, the original house has that bell on it and everything, so it's, it's pretty cool to drive by. Now, we talked about Millersville Normal School as being a teacher college. Linglestown had, had a college also. And that is just, um, that's just east of, uh, as you're kind of leaving what would be the village of uh, Linglestown on the right hand side and if you go there today it'll look more it looks like that blue siding uh, and there's a sign that's not in this picture but just to the right and you can read about the history of it but on the third floor that was a that was a teacher college <laughs> so that was pretty cool and that's still here to you know that's you can go up and touch, well, it's, again, it's a residence, so I don't know if I'd go <laughs> touching it, but you can at least see it. And then, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the, uh, the old firehouse, or the firehouse that took over the original um, Linglestown High School. And that's what's depicted out here, right? Yeah. And if you, when you're leaving tonight, if you look to your right, somebody by hand made a uh, rendition and it sits it's about that big and it's beautiful it's right outside here um it was donated to us dick but Carl, dick carl dick carl made it okay and um uh so that's that was the high school and then it became the old firehouse and when you drive by you can still see the windows how they were that match exactly and then the next one isn't as old of a school, but um, I worked at this building. This is how I paid for my college. Um, this was, this used to be the Seventh Day of Venice School, and it's right on Locust Lane. Um, it's now, is it the Infinity? Inf Inf Charter. Infinity Charter School. And uh, this dates back to the 1940s, but I thought it was kind of neat because it's part of our, part of our history and um, we can see it uh, still today. And like Gary and I were talking the other day, it's kind of hard to visualize, but you can still see it's the brick part that, that's still there. And with that, I'm going to now introduce you to our guest speaker, Gary Christman. I don't do well with a podium, so I'm going to put my notes down. And I'm, this part of the program I think is going to be the fun part. He's given you all the cognitive skills that we would uh, uh, access 
in our academic world, and you would be requ uh, required to have memorized all that because it will be in your exam next week. <laughs> My part is the fun part. Uh, and we're going to play trivia. I'm going to give you some information, and you're going to give information back to me. And then we're going to have an exchange with one another, students versus faculty. But let me pick up where he left off. The last school in all of that historical, chronological uh, direction that he gave to us, one school left that still housed students. And I don't want to talk about that yet because it comes later, but what I would really, and that's, which school was that, anybody know? Last of those old schools that we closed last. Uh, Dave, where did you go to school? Hainland. Hainland. And we will talk about Hainland in a few minutes, but I want to jump back to where he left off with the high school, junior high school, the high school. In, and that school continued until 1955 as a high school. There were a lot of things going on educationally uh, in our, our, our area. In 1955 was the last class to graduate from LP Junior Senior High School. Okay? So from 1955 until 1965, and 1965 is when the Central Dolphin School District became the merger of seven municipalities and school districts. So a lot happened between 55 and 65. And I'll get there in a minute, but I want to talk a little bit about those schools that make up that area. In those days, um, we had Swadera, we had LP, we had Penbrook, we had Paxton, we had Middle Paxton, we had Dolphin, West Hanover. So just keep that in mind for some background night right now. If you were students in any of those school districts, they were elementary. So when you went to junior high, you had to either go to Swadera or you came out to LP. Now, and the elementary schools had their own small identities. All right, now, Hanlon closed in 1964, yeah, and Lower Paxton opened a new elementary school, which was Mountain View, all right? Later on, and this is after um, reorganization and Central Dolphin Schools, we then opened Fishing Creek. And, again, for history, because I told you Dauphin and Middle Paxton were separate school districts in the old days, Dauphin and Middle Paxton finally merged, moved their school up on the hill, and then later on Central Dauphin School District, we tore that building down because it was a horrible mess. You had to go up and down the steps everywhere you went in that building. We tore it down and built the, what I still call the new Middle Paxton Elementary School. So, I want to begin now with 19... Nine, er, 1995 at LP. I would like to show you, I'm 55, I'm sorry. May I see a screen? I want to show you all something. Do you all remember, oh, I'm not allowed to walk over there, am I? Why well, no, but the camera won't get me. But you all can hear me because I can use a school teacher voice. I want you to look at these, these members of the board in 1995, 55. 55. Thank you for correcting me, Helen. This is a name all of us should know. Oscar Lingle was uh, not only a, a, a very large figure in LP, Oscar Lingle was a big figure in Dauphin County. And I'll tell you one more, even beyond that, even to the state and national level. Oscar Lingle, this is really, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm not following your script, but I have to tell you. Oscar Lingle and another uh, very prominent uh, Harrisburg who was nationally involved was, anybody know his bridge named after him? Harvey Taylor. Harvey Taylor. And they were nationally involved in politics. So he was very, very important in Lower Paxton Township. Luther Hocker. Anybody know any history about Luther? What did Luther own? He owned, he owned the auction. And if you would go over to the auction house and he was up auctioning things off, you want me to take this? Because I don't stand still. Okay, if you went there 
and he recognized you in the crowd, he would point you out and embarrass you and then give you, force you to say, oh, that was your bid. I'll never forget that. The best thing I remember about Oscar when I was teaching at, um, was when he, as a school board member, he had a great deal of respect for the cleanliness of our buildings. I remember him at least on four or five occasions at Paxtonia Elementary School. He would get out of his truck, open the doors and walk inside and he immediately took off his shoes. He would walk through the building in his stocking feet because he didn't want to get the building dirty. So, oh, and then we have to go to number three. Also a big name in LP, Tom George served on the school board for 35 years. And also, most of you would know too, that um, Tom was also very much involved here in Lower Paxton Township with our parks and recreation. And, oh, dear Dr. Phil, you know, where the worst part is, I mean, my recogn uh, recognizing myself, I knew all these people. <laughs> so what does that say about me? Dr. Notice it says Reverend Elias Phillips. I don't know that, doc that he had got his doctorate at that point in time, but he was working on it. So we always have to talk about Dr. Phillips because we know the elementary school was named for Dr. Phillips. But the other important thing that I want you all to know, that Dr. Phillips, and if you remember what Dave was saying, uh, Dr. Phillips was very much interested in ch students learning marketable skills for community and for life. Dr. Phillips actually was not only involved with LP, but lived long enough to become part of the initial group of men. It's a sexist comment, I know, but nonetheless. Ah, uh, no, there is one woman. This is real trivial, I just thought of this. There was one woman in LP Township School Board. Anybody remember who it was? Her husband was very, don't, you can't play, Helen. Uh, <laughs> Her husband was very, very much interested in construction in Harrisburg area. Yes, you, and you don't get to count because your sister was named for. <laughs> Would you say it again much louder? Jeanette Alexander. You remember and, Alexander Construction? And the, Gary, that was Gary. Uh, also, I'm speaking from here. Also, the um, HB Alexander is the one that did the construction of the uh, LP Consolidated School. I have to take Mrs. Alexander was the perfect lady. She was, she was a fantastic. Anyway, not only did Dr. Phillips, was he instrumental in getting our Dauphin County Votech started. One more thing I'd tell you about Dr. Phillips because I knew him. He was a great craftsman in, in his own right. He used to make furniture. I remember having to go visit him at his house on Madison Street and go out back to the workshop and he would be working on chairs or tables. My only regret is I never got one. So if you have an opportunity in any public sales, any place in Lower Paxton Township and they have a Dr. Phillips piece, buy it. The other gentlemen, I knew, I knew, I did not know them well. I knew Hiram Freisinger. The other two gentlemen I knew, but I didn't have personal contact with them with, as I did with the other four. Okay, I think I've covered that. Now, I would like to t do something else with a click, because we're going back to LP. You all know who this is if you went to LP. Charlie Foss, not the principal. Now, I want to give you some names and see if you recognize any of these names, and then I'm going to ask you if you have any to add. Whit Gingrich, Alfreda Stamets, Regis Doyle, Richard Bell, Joe Brightbill, Bruce Hanshaw, Eliza Armstrong. I don't know if any of you had her. She was what a teacher she was. John Bruner, and John Bruner is still living. He lives down in Messiah Village. Um, J. Harold Thomas. Any of you have J. Harold for math? You did? Yeah, okay, well, never mind. Her father was a math teacher at Central Dolphin, Paul Lover, in case any of you had Paul for math. This is his daughter. And there was one more person I'd like to sh just share with you who came out of that Lower Paxton contingency. Click. That's the young version. 
If you'd like to see the current version, Bill, will you stand up? I'll tell you one trivia story about Bill Morris. When I was building my house, and I'm one of these people, I am technologic, or, well, oh, I am technologically challenged, but in, um, we were building the house, and I wanted to save some money, so I left the electrician do all the lighting inside the house, but I figured I could handle the lights outside above the doors, or either side of the garage, either side of the front door. So I was talking about this in, uh, with Bill one day, and Bill said, oh, I know how to do that. Why don't I come over to the house and help you? So I said, okay, so he was very gracious, he came over, he helped me, he showed me what to do. So, and the lights all worked fine, so on Monday morning I went back and I said, Bill, there's a problem with the lights. And he said, what's that? I said, well, on the front door, I said, you did one, I did the other. I need to know why is the light on the left, which is the one I did, brighter than the one on the right. <laughs> it was just showing how well his skill went. <laughs> now, I have one more question, based on not only LP, how, well, let me see, this. how many of you went to LP? If you went to LP, stand up, as a student. Super, all right, sit down, and I'd like to ask, are there any faculty members, Bill, you have to get up again, are there any faculty members here from LP, other than Bill? Stand up, Bill, you're the only one in the room. <laughs> you're here. And one of the schools that Dave talked about was Oakdale, which is the Pigeon Club. I still think my old administrative assistant, Mary Hoover, whose farm was right across the street, I think she was one who attended. Is there anybody else here that would have attended any of those schools? Okay, I, I just thought I'd take a chance. Okay, since Bill is, oh. All of you from LP stand up just for a minute. Who went there? I will give any one of you an opportunity to tell with one or two sentences a short story. It has to be one or two sentences because we don't have a, a whole lot of time. And I know Dave's gonna cut me off at some point here. Uh, I'd like to, just to hear a story. You can talk about a student story, an activity story, or you can tell a story about a faculty member, including Bill Morris. Yes. <coughs> oh, here. I was in. They need the I graduated LP junior high in '63, and I can remember if you packed your lunch, you had to go to the annex behind the stage in the auditorium to eat. And we always thought it was a lucky day when we put our nickel in the milk machine and we got two milks. <laughs> I attended Laura Paxton Junior High and I had my future father-in-law as a uh, history teacher. Although I'm married to a history buff, I was not a history person. I got a D in his class and it was probably a gift. <laughs> and I trust that you all know it's Dave Doyle's wife. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, that's right, I forgot. Bill? I'm a 49-year retired teacher. Bill Morris interviewed me for my first teaching interview. Thank you. Anyone else, Anyone else want to make a statement? Because I want to give, oh, yes. My mother would. She is okay. uh, Luther Hawker's daughter. Excellent. Yes. And I, I also went, I graduated here in 1946 from Laura Paxton. Wow. So I, and I also did artwork for the yearbook. Oh, oh my gosh. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes. I remember two teachers. Well, you use this only because they're recording it. That's why they're having trouble with me because I'm not supposed to. I remember two teachers that were mentioned, Miss Snap and Miss yeah. Straw. Ah, yes, that's the name I didn't come up with. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember when we had a bomb scare, 
and they had us all out. I, was it eighth or ninth grade? I think it was my ninth grade year. I graduated from there in 59, from junior high. And we eventually got on buses and they took us home. And they, of course they were all fake. Somebody, somebody wanted a day off. <laughs> okay, any more students want to say anything? Well then, then I'm gonna let the senior elder living faculty member if he would like to make some comments about LP. <laughs> Well, one comment I'd like to make, you, you mentioned Elias Phillips, yes. and, and he was really an influence in the development of schools in, in Lower Paxton Township. And I remember as a first year teacher at Lower Paxton, and uh, we put on a school play and Charlie Fosnott was the play director. <laughs> and uh, there was a scene in that play where uh, one of the class, one of the members of the cast, be, had a, a bottle in a, a bottle of alcohol, of an alcoholic beverage, in a little tub, and would continue nipping it and get intoxicated. <laughs> and as a result of Elias Phillips and his church, that bottle was changed to Orange Crush, <laughs> and instead of becoming intoxicated, the young man got an upset stomach. <laughs> Also, on Wednesday nights in the township, in the school district, you never scheduled any activity. Wednesday night, you were to be in church. And that was an influence of, well, we miss that sort of influence now. And uh, this guy, I remember what, what, what an energetic young teacher he was. And I really, really enjoyed watching him progress in the school district until he became my boss. <laughs> and that was kind of the end of things with Gary. <laughs> You're finished. I was never his boss. We were always colleagues, always. All right, now, I want to leave the junior high and I want to talk about the elementaries. So here's what I'd like to do. I'm not going to tell you which school, but I'm going to give you some names. You tell me which school this is. Mrs. Priest, Mrs. Manso, two Mrs. Millers, and a Mrs. Haig. I know one person knows the answer to this question. What school is it, David? Hanlon. Did anyone in this room attend Hanlon? Good. How about some stories? And I know there are no teachers. There are only two living teachers that ever taught at Hanlon. Mary Ellen Kepler, who taught second grade. I taught there for one semester because I graduated in the middle of the year. We were short staff, and the other art teacher had to, we had to teach every other week in the schools because we were short. So I taught there only from Febu February or March to June, and then we closed the school. So, Hayland people, give us a story. I, I mean, a nice, well, I know you can do that. <laughs> well, I'll share a story that my cousin, who was not able to come tonight, Bill Gregory, he graduated there, didn't he, Carol, from high school? No, he graduated from Laura Paxa. I mean, Laura Paxa, I'm sorry. Hanlon, he mentioned that Hanlon, he went there when they had outhouses. And they had a pump, and, that, and they had a tin cup there, and they, that's how they would get their water. Marianne and I held it all day. <laughs> <laughs> I also remember that teachers had paddles, yes. and we had ink wells. Yes. And, uh, and, and you had a pen, that you had to put the pen point right. in, and then round, round, ready, right. One, two, three, four, five, yes. six, seven, eight. Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Goodman. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that's a real piece of trivia. I went there uh, from kindergarten to third grade, and then they built Phillips Elementary. But I remember going in kindergarten, I had Mrs. Wolf. Yeah. Uh, and Marky Mark Wolf, yes. Okay, I'm going to give you that. She changed schools. Oh, okay. You're going to hear her name, but you're going to hear someplace else, and you're going to have to identify where. 
Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> All right, here come the next set of names. I Gary, I, I, Gary, before we start, um, was Hanlon not your first school that you taught at? And if so, was that your car that you pulled up in? <laughs> I love you too, David. <laughs> yeah, that was my first car. <laughs> All right, here are the names. You tell me the school. Mrs. Shirk, Mrs. Went, Mrs. Foner, Mrs. Zimmerman, Mr. Knoll, Mr. Harrigan, Gus Kikas, Bill Smith, and B.J. Turgeon. Southside, absolutely. Okay, any staff members from Southside? I can't believe all these people are that old. All right, anybody attended as a student? You went to Southside? Then you have to tell us a story. I, if you, if, all right, then I will, <laughs> I will tell you two, uh, two, two quick stories about two people who went to Southside. One is um, Janine Turgeon, retired Dauphin County judge. She went to Southside. Her mother, BJ Turgeon, was our school nurse. And the other one is a financial planner, who's now retired, Jeff Hochlander. Now, those, both of those individuals are adults, have very professional careers, have done very, very well. But I also, in, in my age, I socialize with those people. So when we're out, both of them know this is what they say. They will say, oh, Gary and I went to school together, because that's what I told them they were supposed to say. <laughs> the only thing is they put a comma at the end of that phrase and say, I rode the bus and Gary drove. <laughs> so that's, all right, good, let's keep going. Mrs. George, which was to be Tom George's wife, Miss Mangle, Mr. Bazdar, Mrs. Moyer, Mrs. Elaine Moyer, Mr. Russell, Ammon Meyer, Ken Hawk, Frank Bruner, Bev Hawk, Polly Farner, Mrs. Went, Bell Oberheim, Mrs. Chrisman, Barb Gutshaw, Gay Mac, Mrs. Fortino. What school? Lingolstown. Okay, any faculty members from Lingolstown? Put your hand up. I'd like to hear a story about. Lingolstown from a faculty because we're going to give the students the same opportunity if there are any here from Lingolstown. Well, I, okay, this is personal for you, Gary. <laughs> um, I had, when I was teaching there, I, was, I had both of my children. And um, so I had the very best substitute teacher. <laughs> and we worked it out and we discussed it ahead of time. and. And Helen came in and, and taught for me for both of my children. <laughs> I hope they turned out okay. They did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any students who went to Lingolstown? Oh, oh, three up here. Okay, let's go. I want stories from all three. Oh, oh you have your own I mic. Have, I have my own mic. You don't me. need me. I came back uh, from Southside to for fifth grade at Lingolstown Elementary and had, Ro I think it was Rose Seiler. We just called her Mrs. Seiler. We never called our teachers by our first names then. So, but she got us interested in, and back in those days, we would get down to, the, down to Gettysburg uh, Battlefield every year. And it was because of Rose Seiler that I became very interested in history. So I owe her a lot for, uh, for my love of, love of history. I'm glad the teacher made an impact. She did. There are a couple others up here. I don't speak. <laughs> All right. With so my, um, I transitioned between Lower Paxton and Lingolstown a number of years uh, as transitions were going on. So I, I went to. Because you were bad, they had to. Make <laughs> yeah, I went to Lower Paxton for kindergarten, uh, first and second grade. Mrs. Miller, you mentioned. Um, With, there are a couple of Millers. Yes, yeah, so of the In two. Phillips, it was second grade was Millie Miller. Then I transferred to Lower pa to Lingolstown for third grade. The first year was opened. Then I went back to Lower Paxton as it became the junior high school for fourth grade and went back to Lingolstown for fifth and sixth. So I had Arlene Moyer. Um, Music. Uh, Robert No, Cook. Arlene was, yeah, Arlene was first grade. Well, Arlene Moyer was third grade when I had her, her, oh, her first okay. year. And then I think it was Robert Cook who became a principal. Bob Cook who became principal recently, of another school. He recently died. At which I'm not going to identify. And, and Phyllis Mangle for sixth. But my story is 
I fell in love and had the biggest crush of my life, and I still remember it to this day with Arlene Moyer. <laughs> and she lived in Lingolstown yes. on the square, right across the street from the funeral home. And my aunt and uncle lived on the other side of the square where I would visit. And every time almost I would visit, I would go visit Arlene. Okay. I had this crush that was so strong. It was amazing. And probably some of you have had that too on your teachers. But boy, I remember that crush I had on her. Yes. That's good. Story. Thank you. Yes, Dad. <laughs> Phil, if you had such a romantic crush on your teacher, why didn't you accept your opportunity to teach in our school district and spend your life with her? <laughs> well, can't win them all, Bill. All right, moving on. Anybody else have any comments about Lingolstown? All right, here are the names. Mame Yeager, Bob Cook, Mrs. Halton, Mrs. Foner, Mrs. Nipple, and Darlene Canals. Those are faculty members from a particular school. Obviously, there's no one here either, faculty or students. Paxtonia Elementary. You had Mrs. Nipple in kindergarten. And you should be following the straight and narrow path because that's the way she operated in her classroom. <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. Mrs. Wolf, Mr. Dumbald, Miss Woodruff, Miss Gingrich, Mrs. Unger, Miss Miller, Mrs. Orwin, Mrs. Ward, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Owen slash Dunn, Mrs. French, Mrs. Warden, Mrs. Shoup, Mr. Went, Betty Reese, Thad Carr, Carol Miller, Veda, Veda Brocious, Roseanne Deal, Winifred Scott, Gertrude Fromm, Mildred Yinkst, Bill Nixon, Gus Zemba, Francis Romberger, and Mrs. Dahl. This one's the easiest one for all of you, I would bet. It's Phillips Elementary. Any faculty members from Phillips in attendance, please stand up. Yeah. I was going to say, if you didn't get up, I was going to, you know. All right, faculty, it's your t Oh, no, 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 faculty, stay up. I want to hear stories from faculty. I was at Southside, and I was being transferred to Phillips. And Marlene Zook, at the time, was the librarian at E.H. Phillips. And I was looking forward to my transfer to Phillips until she came to me and said, don't believe anything you hear about the faculty at Phillips. They're a nice group of people. <laughs> I was in three different schools in the district, and Phillips was by far my favorite, so she was right. <laughs> I was very lucky as a second grade teacher to have met this man and gotten married 50 years ago. Well, he was a guidance counselor when we... Oh, well, yeah. he had already moved. Well, yeah, because he was dating someone else. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and I taught with Mary Alice when she was in fourth grade. I was in second the whole time. She was in fourth grade, and then she switched to second, and then we toughed it out and retired together <laughs> after many years. And I had Mr. Dumball and Miss Woodruff in school. <laughs> By the way, for those of you who didn't know, Ms. Woodruff was obviously, because now Mrs. Dumbledore, she explained. <laughs> All right, back row. <laughs> well, one of my, probably my first year at E.H. Phillips, and the first day I was introducing myself to the students, and one little girl raised her hand, and she said, now keep in mind my husband attended Phillips um, as a student. She raised her hand and said, my mom dated your husband. <laughs> Uh, I, I spent many years in Central Dauphin School District, and I probably worked in almost every building in the district. When I first started, I was at all three junior highs, and then I started as a counselor. My first year was at Phillips, and 
Middle Paxton, then I was at Phillips and Fishing Creek, then I was full-time at Phillips, and my last four years before I retired, I was at Pax Hang in Chambers Hill. And I have to tell you that of all the buildings, not that anything was wrong with any of the others, but Phillips always holds a special place in my heart. It was wonderful and the best staff ever. Hi, I'm Kim Harnsberger. Um, I worked at Phillips and Northside as a school nurse for 19 years, and I just recently retired. Um, Mrs. Addy was my kids' uh, guidance counselor, and Mrs. Doyle was my daughter's teacher, so it holds a special Thank you. thing to my That's heart. great for faculty. I want to hear the real story. <laughs> <laughs> students, and there have got to be students here. All right, go, go for it. Oh, here, I'll give you my mic. Well, uh, yeah, I, I used to go to E.H. Phillips years and years ago. Uh, I remember Mrs. Wolf. Wolf. I remember uh, Mrs. Miller that taught second grade there. Uh, I remember Mrs. Unger in third grade. Mrs. Orwan, I think, in fourth. Yes. yes. Uh, Miss Mangle, who later became Mrs. Miss G Mrs. Gingrich, yes. I think in fifth grade, and in the sixth grade was one of my favorite teachers, Mrs. Korsgan. Mrs. Korsgan. Yeah, yes. and uh, I'd like to do another little uh, thing here. Diane Robinson here used to teach our daughter Tabitha oh. <laughs> in uh, what was it second grade? Second, second grade. Yep. yep. <laughs> so. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tiff. I'm Dave's daughter, and a couple teachers here. I had Mrs. Robinson in second grade. Mrs. Addy was my guidance counselor. Um, but a cool story about Phillips is that my dad went there, I went there, my brother went there, and my kids went there, and my mom taught there. So, and my grandfather taught there. So we have a long history with our last Doyle, not a Doyle, but finishing this year at Phillips. And we appreciated that continuation from generation to generation. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I can tell you one short story about Margie Wolf, first grade teacher. Now, for those of you who know Margie, Margie stood about this tall. Well, in Margie's classroom, she liked to hang up all the work of all the students. So she had clotheslines running from the, across the room, back and forth, almost like a, a weave. You know what, when I had to go in to teach in her classroom, I walked in and all the strings caught me right here. <laughs> Say, Margie, you gotta do something. Just clean out the front of the classroom, do something. But it was her level. Her room, I had to adapt. Any, come on, any other students? All right, then I need to move on. Mr. William Smith, Mrs. Phillips, Mrs. Pomeroy, Mrs. Zerby, Mr. Olsh, Mrs. Schwab, Ms. Wilson, Mr. Bingaman, Mrs. Reams, Susan Linker, Lalo, and B.J. Turgeon. Northside Elementary. Bill Smith was a principal there uh, before he left, he left the district and went on to Shippensburg to teach. Mrs. Phillips taught first grade, and it was Dr. Phillips' wife. And I taught with her in that building. So there are no faculty, oh, and Ken Beard, yes. We have, yeah, and of course you all know Ken, uh, who was at Northside for ages. And there are no faculty here from Northside. Any, any students? Who? Yeah. Oh yeah, before he taught at, Mr. Beard taught at Phillips. He left to go to open Mountain View. When he opened Mountain View, Mr. Wendt, who was in fifth grade, moved to sixth grade at Phillips Elementary. Well, I was gonna tell you something more about Northside, I forget it was. Oh, Mrs. Phillips, I did tell you about her. And I don't know if, if uh, any, well, you guys don't know because you didn't say. Um, Susan Linker, and she married and then she was Lalo. Susan Linker was uh, part of the Linker Dairy Farm uh, and that whole conglomerate. All right, let's go to another school. Oh, yes, I forgot another one. Dr. Phillips' daughter taught music in Lower Paxton schools. Anybody remember her name? This is real trivia. Her name was Mildred Yinkst. She taught at Northside, she taught at Phillips because she traveled like I did. Yes? I think wasn't there a Mrs. Phillips who taught, I think, fifth grade at Paxton Elementary? 
that was a different Mrs. Phillips. The, Dr. Phillips' wife taught at uh, Northside first grade, well, she taught at Phillips first, the, then she went to Northside, and then she retired from Northside. Yeah, I, I think, I'm almost sure it was a different Mrs. Phillips. Yeah, one more. Ken Beard, John Harrigan, Bill Beaver, Peggy Elder, Donna Derrickson, Norm Daniels. Anybody from Mountain View faculty? Any students? The school? Mountain View. Oh, sorry. Oh, you have a mic. There was two sixth grades at Mountain View. One was taught by uh, Mr. Hawk, and the other one was taught by Ken Beard, who did double duty both as principal and as a sixth, a sixth grade teacher. But I remember very, very well the sixth grade spelling bee. And there was probably, a, I guess, probably was 40 of us in all, and it came down to two people. It was myself and one other lady, one other gal, and the word was comical and I lost. <laughs> and the winner was Kendra Beard. Ken, oh. <laughs> so I lost to the principal's daughter. <laughs> All right, we're, we're through the schools. Uh, but I wanted to just, before we get to the 1965, there's one piece of trivia. Do you remember when uh, Dave showed you the school board and then I showed you the school board? Uh, one person appears in all of those pictures. Tom George. Now, if you remember, I told you he's been for 35 years. Gary, push your button down. Pardon? Your mic's off. Am I okay now? You're good. Okay, did you, I'm sure you all heard it because I have a school teacher voice. Okay, so all of that was happening. In 1965, we had the full merger of Lower Paxton Township with the other municipalities of Pembroke. Paxtang, Dauphin, Middle Paxton, and they all came together and we formed Central Dauphin School District. So, in, and beyond that, as you all know, because we all live in Central Dauphin School District, but when you think about seven municipalities with very, very different social economic uh, backgrounds came together to form one school district. And there are oftentimes, I, I'll, I never forget this one, when I was sitting in the office, people would come in, especially out, out of towners, and they'd, sit, they'd look at the map and they'd say, what's this island over here? Oh, you mean Pembroke? Well, yeah, but they're not, they're not contiguous with any other part of the land. And we had 125 square miles of school district. That's why we were, the, and I don't know where we are now, but when I was still there, when I left, in 99, we were the 11th largest school district in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Pretty good. But the Sorry, I get emotional about the next one. Because even though we were the 11th, there was never a week that would go by <laughs> that I wouldn't get a phone call from a school district somewhere in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania would say, you guys are doing this and you're doing that. Can may we come and observe? And always, always, yes. We wanted to share our skills, our talents of our people. You did a super job. I'll tell you one funny story and then I'm done. Okay, may I tell one more story? That's exactly the story I'm going to tell. It's my last story of the evening. Um, one day, you know, we live in the shadow of the Department of Education. And uh, it was the time when Pennsylvania uh, reached out to other countries around the world because we had, and then we, then, we had a pretty good Department of Transportation. And so other countries would want to come here and study our Department of Transportation. So they would send families for the year. And so they were always told to find housing in Central Dolphin School District. 
So I got a phone call from Ken Adams from the department. He said, Gary, you had to s establish and set up a program. Now, this is another piece of trivia. We had to set up the first English as a Second Language program at Fort Indian Town Gap, and, and my team had to put that together. So we had a, a program in place. So he said, we have 10 Russian families that are moving into the school district. Will you provide English is a second language. Well, what, what am I going to say? No, I did find another district. So he said, of course. So we had them over at East Junior High. And so I, I grabbed all the foreign language teachers and I said, okay, which one of you speaking uh, speak Russian? You know how many people I had stand up and say yes? <laughs> Zero. So we were, uh, some of our teachers were going in and trying to help. And then we had hired a young man by the name of Ivan Bukaru. Fresh out of college, he was a business major. We brought him into central office. He was helping with the accounting. I'm sorry, um, with the accounting. And I didn't realize we had hired his dad, who was a custodian at East Junior High. Bukaroos were from Russia. So when I, when I finally got all this, I, I called Herb Biddle, who was the principal. I said, Herb. Go get Ivan. Take him off custodial duties. I want him in the classroom doing translation and working with the kids. He said, okay. And the program is working fine. This is the best part of the story. Ken Adams from the Department of Ed called me and he said, Gary, he said, I have to come out and do an assessment of your English as a second language for your Russian students. I said, okay, come, Ken. I knew I had about 20 minutes from the time he left the Department of Education. I called Herb Biddle and I said, Herb, under no circumstances tell him that Russian or that Ivan is not a teacher. <laughs> so, um, Adam shows up and he goes over to East Junior High and he comes back and he said, Gary, that's really a good program. He said, that guy that you have in there, he said, that teacher is just excellent. And I said, Ken, will you walk two doors from where my office is? I want your written report. I want it in my hands before you file it when you get back downtown. So he went and wrote it and came back and gave it to me. I said, fine. And I said to Mary Hoover, I said, put this in the file. It's locked. It's signed, sealed, and delivered. And then I said, Ken, could we have a conversation off the record? <laughs> and I shared. He said, you didn't tell me that, Gary. It's, for me, it's one of the best stories only because it exemplifies what we do. So my comment to you is thank you. Okay. I don't know if there's any Q&A or not. Does anybody have any questions or would like to say anything else? Yeah. It's like, I, I was like, what? Oh, yeah. I'll tell you this funny story, too. Carol? Carol's teach. Do you want to tell the story? No, you can tell it. It happened to you. <laughs> <laughs> At East Junior High, there was a secretary by the name of Gladys Dockerty. Oh, yeah. Fantastic lady. She and I used to have this running thing about St. Patrick's Day. Obviously, she was green Irish. My name's Christmas. I'm German. Uh, but I played the game with her, you know. So every St. Patrick's Day. Gary. We, could you, could you tell the story again using the microphone? Because they can't pick it up back there on the ABC News. So every St. Patrick's Day, we would have this thing going. I would get up at like 5, 30, 6 o'clock because I had to be in her building. And I'd put green shamrocks around and get her a green cake. Sometimes I even had carnations dyed green. And I'd put them in the faculty room and say, give them to this lady. And, say, and she'd come over to my office at the same time I was in hers, and then she had a Blarney stone because it was left over from one of the plays, you know, and she did all this. And the last year she was there, and I can say this now because we'd never be able to do this under any circumstances today, she actually got our bus that had the top cut off. It was our Van Gogh bus for the art department. She got the, some of the kids who played music, they pulled out onto Rutherford Road in front of my office and started playing Irish music. <laughs> It wound up in the Patriot News, and I was afraid that somebody was going to say, Gary, you can't do that, and we didn't. But yeah, those are some of the fun things that we do, but we were great. Yeah. We still are. So thank you. What? Oh, so yeah. So one night, oh, that's why I was supposed to tell you. That I wouldn't let, they wouldn't let me in the building. So I went over the night before. I didn't wait till the morning. I went over, knocked on the door. Custodian came to the door and said, who are you? I said, I, I'm Gary Christman. I'm a staff member. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't let you in the building. 
I said, what do you mean? I said, isn't there anybody else nearby? He said, she, he said, Joe Dubs is down in his office. He was the music teacher. I said, go tell Joe to come up and tell them I'm legitimate. I can come into your building. So Joe came up and he looked at me. He said to the custodian, I don't know him at all. <laughs> oh, all kinds of wows. Oh, I'll tell you one more. Can I? One night, it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, because I always get those kind of phone calls. One morning at 3 o'clock in the morning, Bob Schweitzer, who is in our buildings and grounds department, called me and said, Gary, we have a problem. Well, there must be a problem if you're calling me at 3. And you have to come to East Junior High now. Why? Well, because we have three students on the roof. I've called the police department, but you need to come. Now, he knew full well I hate heights. So I got over, he said, you have to go up the ladder. I said, no, no, we're going to wait for the police department to come, and they're going to go up. And they did. But those are the kind of fun. Oh, let me tell you a fun story. At C Central Dolphin High School, when Larry Musseline was the principal, and Nor Vishnesky, those guys climbed up on the roof and spent the night on the roof to raise money. I, I was cancer or four diamonds or something. I had been out for a formal dinner that night, and they called and said, Gary, you just have to make an appearance. I said, OK. I made an appearance, and then they said, you have to climb up the ladder. <laughs> they would not let me go. I had to climb the ladder. I was scared to death. But would I show it to them? No way. <laughs> Those are just some of the fun things. That's why I said I was hoping that tonight you guys would have some fun stories to share, because this is one great family. So OK, anybody else want to say anything? So I'm like, oh, yeah, go ahead, before Dave shuts us down. Oh, I'll share a funny story with you. Um, I was in Central Dolphin High School, and my, one of my study hall teachers was Mrs. Cobb, who taught shorthand. Yes. The funny thing is, she had my father at Laura Paxton High School, 1944. And she, told, and she remembered him. And I said, boy, that's scary. But... She said she wasn't Mrs. Cobb at Laura Paxton, and I forget what her maiden name was, but Mr. Cobb was the principal. He was her boss, and she married him and became his boss. <laughs> Bill, do you remember Eleanor's maiden name? I don't. No, she was Mrs. Cobb when I met her. Yeah, and her husband left Central Dolphin School District to go, and he worked in the Department of Education for a number of years. Yeah. Oh, wow. This is, these are so cool. Anybody wants to talk? I'll be glad to share more trivia with you after we're shut down by Mr. Doyle. Gary, I have a, a story about uh, my father. So uh, Regis Doyle taught at, um, taught at CD, or at LP, taught history. And uh, um, things were done differently then. So two kids are getting into a fight in the hall. And uh, he and Terry King broke it up. And they said to the two kids, my dad said, I will see you both tomorrow morning, 6.30, behind the building, and Terry will have boxing gloves. And then you can go at it. They didn't show up. They settled it. <laughs> oh, this, good story. Good story. Okay, oh. I have one. Okay. okay, I'm one of those secondary people, since you all seem to be elementary people. But anyway, my first year in 1971, I walked into my health class, and the girls, and back then we still had it segregated, and I had all the girls, and there were kids or girls sitting around on the shelves or whatever, and, you know, being a first-year teacher, I had to, you know, lay down the law, and I said, find seats. There aren't any. Fifty-two girls in a health class. And by the time I retired, people were complaining that they had 20 or 30. <laughs> I had 62 in a phys ed class with half a gymnasium. You just adapt and you just teach. I can think of another one. Bill, you're going to have to help me with this one. Back at old LP, at one point in time, Secondary students came in the morning. Elementary students came in the afternoon because of a building need. So, am I right? Did I get that one right, Bill? Yeah. 
And the other story that hasn't been told, but should have been told, is about a, a, a male student at Phillips Elementary School. And in that particular classroom, he was busy talking with his friends. And the classroom teacher said, stop talking. Well, the talking continued. So he, the teacher finally said, listen, if you want to talk to somebody, you can talk to the tree. Follow me. Took them outside, had them stand around a tree and talk to the tree. Isn't that true, David? And wasn't it Mr. Carr? I have no recollection of that. <laughs> But the, but the tree is still there. The tree, yeah, the, the tree remembers. And David, we stopped, we stopped with 1964-65 with the merger. If we have time, I'm willing to go beyond that, but I'm assuming we don't. We should probably call it an evening. And, uh, Let's have him back. And this was great. You, thank you're more you. than welcome to come back. Cause, uh, uh, and first off, thank you. It was great having everybody here tonight, and um, feel free to look at the uh, artifacts over there as we as we clean up. And 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 we just uh, received we received a, a a yearbook, which I want to thank you. And we just received this jacket up here that we will put into our archives. Um, please, before you think about throwing anything away that deals with Lower Paxton, and I'm talking, you may think it's junk. Um, get a hold of us because uh, we're always looking and eventually someday might not be in our lifetime but we're trying we, we will have a local museum so that's that's what we have so with that said is there any other public comment thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. it was fun thank, thank you. you may I ask for a motion to adjourn so second. second all in favor Aye. adjourn I have to get Dave to get that yearbook back to, to Bill if he has it with me.